not very difficult to see. Two lines. So, convergence is equal to uniform conversion. That is a nice thing about it. The second thing is that we introduce the notion of a family F contained in this space. It's called one uniformly bounded. If it is bounded in this nonlinear space, okay, if as a family in this nonlinear space, it is bounded. What does that mean? A 
it is there exists an m greater than 0 such that the norm is less than or equal to m for every f in this this boils down to uniform borderedness. If norm is less than this, maximum itself is less than m. So, fx is less than equal to m for every x for every f. So, that is mod fx is less than equal to m for every x. And we call it equicontinuous the last thing I discussed. If for every epsilon positive there is a delta such that this one works in the definition of the mod uh, x minus y less than delta x y is 0 1 implies f x minus f y is less than epsilon for every x uh, for every Okay, that is what is equicontinuous, it is uniformly uniformly continuous. It is just uniformly continuous if that delta depended on each f. If we can choose it independent of f, it becomes equicontinuous. And now we start comparing it this space with what is happening on the real line or our n dimensional space make some comments okay uh, we have on the one side our uh, space where we have r rn c cn etc now we have constructed a new space first for the first time we have constructed a space where which consists of functions okay it's a space of functions and it's infinite dimensional i mean that's another because the polynomials 1 x x squared x to the power of n etc form a linearly independent set Therefore, there is an infinite linearly dependent set and hence it must be an infinite dimensional set. So, let us note that also. Okay. What do you C. CR01 is an infinite dimensional vector space since the set Fnx n equal to 0 to infinity where f n x is equal to x to the power of n is a infinite linearly independent. So, for the first time in a sense we are uh, getting on to some very uh, non unusual uh, uh, vector space infinite dimensional. On the first, first we had finite dimension. First we had real numbers, one dimensional. Then we had finite dimension, we allowed n components. Then we allowed l, little l2, little lr, little lp, etc. We allowed infinite number of components, but they were a sequence of components. But the first time, in a sense, we are allowing an uncountable number of components, fx. Okay? So, there is going to be some strange things. Even in, in the other case, when the moment you get into infinite, certain strange things happen. We will see what are some of the strange things that happen. Okay. Sir. Yes. In a nonlinear space, sir, do we have the notion of uniformly bounded? No. This this notion of uniformly bounded is in our uh, fam as a family of continuous functions. What we have is uniformly bounded. That boils down to the normally usual boundedness in the nonlinear space. <coughs> so that the what is the concept of boundedness in this nonlinear space? It's the same as the original uniform boundedness that we had. Okay. Sir, uh, doesn't equicontinuous imply uniformly bounded? <coughs> Why? And for this particular C R zero one. Hmm? I don't know. I will think about it. Think about it. Just a constant for. Okay. Okay. Got it? Right. Uh, where was that? So, this is an infinite dimensional space. 
Now I am going to look at certain things that happened in, uh, this is one model of infinite dimension space, we have an infinite number of components and other models are of course the L1, the L2 and the LP, little L1, little L2, little L3, general. So we are now a whole lot of infinite dimension spaces in our hand. Uh, I am going to look at, I don't know, I mean, why I st started thinking about it, it's different. Uh, then I decided let's talk about it, okay, it was not what I really plan. Okay. Anyway, now having come to this way, let's continue with this. Uh, so we have, <coughs> let us first of all look at R and N. See certain things for that. In R and N, we study lots of transformations. And the simplest one we study are the linear transformations. Okay. And linear transformations R and N means simply matrices, N by N. So if you have A and N by N matrix, we have A mapping R N by R N to R N defined as A X, X going to A X. So how is this defined? The ith component of the transformed vector is obtained by the matrix multiplication. How do I multiply the vector by the matrix? Take the ith row and multiply it by the vector. So I have to take the ith row and then multiply it by the vector. That's how I obtain the ith component of this. I do it for every year. Now, I, so A is a, uh, a is a n by n real matrix. A is a linear transform. <coughs> it preserves superpositions. A matrix multiplication preserves superpositions. And now, on the n dimensional real space, you can put a lot of matrix, so you can put a lot of norms. Okay, let's put a lot of norms. You can put the maximum norm, you can put the L2 norm, the usual distance norm, or you can put the L1 norm. You can put the LP norm, whatever norm you can you want, you can put. So, with respect to any norm, on uh, Rn, A is a continuous transformation. What does that mean? That is, Xn converges to X in that norm, implies a x n converges to a x in that way. So, if you have p now, the corresponding p now. Okay. The, so, in other words, we direct the, if you look at the R n as a space, which has basically uh, three operations, let me split it as three operations. One is addition, which involves only vectors in that space. The other one is scalar and a vector, it is a scalar multiplication and the third one is limiting because the topology there now we have a limiting process. What this fellow does is it preserves all of them in the, in the process of transforming, it does not destroy the addition, it does not destroy the scalar multiplication, it does not destroy the limits. Okay? So it preserves, if something converts here, corresponding images converge to the corresponding image. So the, everything is nicely preserved. And so therefore, these are the decent ones to study first. Right. Now, what should be the correct, suppose I take, just to start with, CR01. What should be the corresponding stuff here? If I want to look at this place of all continuous functions. I must have something that maps F2 some k. That is a continuous function must be mapped onto a continuous function. Now if I want to copy this in the place of a matrix which is a discrete function defined on ij, right? So I must have some kind of suppose kxy is a function 
defined for for example here it is defined for i equal to 1 to n j equal to 1 to n that is 1 to n cross 1 to n now my domain of definition is And I copy this, define KF as follows. Here I had AX, I evaluated it at I. So now I will evaluate KF at X. What is the value of the transformed fellow? What are the coordinates of the transformed fellow? The Xth coordinate I should apply by looking at the yth coordinate and then multiplying it and then summing it. Now sum will become, so I should have something like this, k of x, y, f, right? And these are the famous continuous uh, uh, versions of matrix C. Okay. Now of course, <coughs> now I can't be looking at any function k, x, y because crazily this may not be a, the net result that I get may not be a continuous function. I want to make sure that k satisfies enough condition so that the resulting function is continuous. So k at present I will not write anything smooth enough so that k yeah, is continuous is in C R zero one. That is a continuous function for every R. So we have a transformation. <coughs> this is analogous. this, we find it is a linear transformation because if I put an f plus g here, it splits into integral because integral is a linear transformation. So, k is a linear transformation. So, let me not confuse between, let me call this a small k and the transformation as capital. K is a linear transformation. So we would like K to be a continuous transformation because we want all the nice things to be preserved, limiting processes to be preserved, and everything to be nicely preserved. So we want to K want k to be smooth enough, whatever that means, such that what is meant by limits are preserved. Here it says if xn tends to x, now I must take fn tends to f. fn convergence to f in this case means uniform convergence. So if I have a sequence of functions which converge uniformly to f, then the corresponding integral kx y f1 must converge to integral kx y. That will be if one very simple assumptions on k, k will be valid. Okay. Uh, such that fn converges to f uniformly on 0, 1 implies integral kx y fn y dy. Converges uniformly to integral zero to one k x y. Then we have copied the matrix transformation more or less completely. So if the if the uncountable matrix k x y, if we can uh, if we can choose so that this happens then we have practically copied whatever matrix does in the situation of the <coughs> continuous functions. And therefore, we would expect that a lot of things that happens for matrix should happen here also. 
But let me give you one one of the simplest example, one very simple example. I'll I'll look at little more, few more examples later. Now the thing that I wanted to tell was what what I wanted to discuss today was. I, what I had in mind was different, but it so happened that before the class I met somebody in the coffee in the teal kiosk, and there was some discussion. There were some questions that he raised, and uh, because of the doubts that he had in mind, I thought, well, okay, maybe this is something that must be clarified. Okay, so I decided on the way back that okay, let me talk about this. It was almost uh, so the decision triggered by some discussion before the class. Right. Um, uh, so let me give one simple example. If you look at this, define. F must go to K F. As the transform function is simply the indefinite integral of the original function. If you want to calculate, if you want to find the new function, what you do is, if you want to find the value of the new function, transform function at a point, take the area under the curve up to that point. That's all. Take the area under the curve up to that point. So if we have the 0, 1, and here is the function f, and if you want kf at the point x, take this here, and then sweep out the area, slowly. That's what I have done. So, actually if you look at carefully, what is this kxy in this case? Yes? Step function. I will call it f of y dy. So, kxy is 1, if y is less than x, 0, y is greater than x. On x it doesn't matter, it's a minus 0. So it is like our lower triangular matrix. It's almost like a lower triangular matrix. If the column index goes beyond the row index, it is 0. So it's a lower triangular. So it really mimics the lower triangular matrix. So mimics lower triangular matrix. Anyway, it's a triangular matrix. It's a triangular matrix. It's a triangular matrix. Okay. Uh, and it's easy to see this condition is satisfied. This is linear anyway. Now, only thing is we want it to be continuous. If fn converges to f uniformly, certainly the integral converges to f uniformly. It's very easy to see that. Okay, so one, it is linear. Okay, that's obvious. Now, why is it continuous? Turns out. What should we make sure that if fn converges to f uniformly? The transformed version goes, okay, this is, uh, suppose f n tends to f uniform. What does that say? This implies for every epsilon 1 greater than 0, there exists an n such that n greater than or equal to n implies mod f n x minus f x is less than epsilon, the maximum <coughs> because of the uniform convergence. And therefore, integral of mod fn x minus fx will be d or fn y, y d zero to x will be less than or equal to integral 0 to x epsilon 1. Because this curve lies above 
that cut. The area of below this will be certainly less than the area below this. Okay. This is again I have not done integration, but you, uh, look at your intuition. So this will be epsilon 1 into x. But x is less than 1, so this is less than epsilon. So mod fn x minus fy dy is less than epsilon 1. Oh, I have chosen epsilon itself. I thought I have put ab and I wanted to adjust. So I have put 0 once so I am lucky. Otherwise, I would have got a b minus a. So therefore, for every epsilon positive, there exists an n such that n greater than or equal to n implies what is this? K f n x minus k f n y k f y k f x is less than epsilon whatever x I chose for every x because I have removed the x by this maximum 1. So therefore the maximum of x belong to 0, 1, mod k of n minus k f is epsilon, which means f k of n <coughs> converges to k f. We could make the error small unit. So therefore, we have got this also. Therefore, it is a continuous. So, therefore, k, k is a continuous. So it's a one of the simplest examples which mimics the lower triangle. But the mimicking ends there. I mean a lot of difference between a lower triangular matrix and this. They've used the mod of the integral is the integral. Yeah, I just use the area concept. Okay. Look at the two mods, both are above the x-axis. One curve lies below the other curve, so the area must be less. So it's just applied to common sense. Okay. I've not gone to the details of integral. That's where this picture is. Suppose fn mod, mod fn minus f is this curve and it lies below the constant curve epsilon 1 and therefore that area will be more than this area. That is what I Right. Uh, well, uh, yeah, obviously I have not introduced integration but this is only to uh, assuming that we know such some simple facts about Riemann integrals. So I am not even using the wing Okay. So now we have one example at least. <coughs> now if you look at this, let me uh, look at this and compare it with the lower triangular matrix. If you had a lower triangular matrix, what will be its eigenvalues? All the diagonal entries. But now we want to general, uh, want to know the notion of eigenvalues for such matrices. Okay. So now the notion of eigenvalues. So if A is an n by n real matrix, a real number lambda. is called an eigenvalue if what? So we do not want to give the definition in terms of determinant. If it is a root of determinant of lambda i minus a equal to because the moment you give the definition in terms of the determinant, we have to know what is what is the corresponding version of determinant here. Yes, after a roundabout way, finally we find out what is known as the so-called Fedorm determinant. There is some, in the, in the case of the, there, there will be a meromorphic function which will come out as a determinant. But we will not go, that's a long route, which is done exactly 100 years ago by Fedorm. In fact, there is a very famous story that uh, there was a fundamental question which physicists were interested about a Laplacian operator. Uh, on a certain um, on the standard domains, say two or three dimensions, whether it has an eigenvalue, whether the Laplacian operator has an eigenvalue. And apparently Hilbert felt that uh, it is going to be a very tough problem to give a form and prove that there exists an eigenvalue, it is going to take a long time. And uh, within a year after that statement was made by Hilbert, 
Fred Holm used Hilbert space theory to show that there is an eigenvalue. So, well, uh, so there, the, in that context, Fredholm really sweats it out uh, to see the determinant coming in there. Okay? It's now known as the Fredholm determinant. But anyway, we'll, uh, that's, we'll just look at the other definition. If there exists an x in Rn and x not equal to 0 such that a x equal to <coughs> lambda x. Okay. So now correspondingly I must define here if k map C R 0 1 to C R 0 1 continuous linear transformation we say a real number lambda is an eigenvalue of k if there exists an f in CR01 and what is meant by f not equal to 0? Non zero function. Not the zero function. Non zero function or not the zero function. Not, not the zero vector of that space. What is the zero vector of that space? The norm must be zero. Norm means the maximum of the function is zero, which means the function must be identically zero. So yeah, what this means is fx not identically zero. There is at least one point where it is non-zero. If it is non-zero at one point in an interval, it will be non-zero. So, okay, there will be, the curve must rise or go below the x-axis at least in a small place, okay. That is what I meant by the non-zero vector such that kx equal to, or kf is equal to lambda. Right. Now, let us look at this up. That example that we had, that transformation which we may make the lower triangular matrix. Okay. So now let us look at where was this? So now uh, where is it? I go now. Here. Look at the transformation. <laughs> A by C R zero one C R zero one defined as K F equal to integral zero to X Now we will see what are its eigenvalues. Okay. So now let's look for its eigenvalues. First of all, let us dispose of the case 0, whether 0 can be an eigenvalue. So, if so lambda equal to 0 an eigenvalue implies there exists an f not equal to 0 such that kf equal to lambda f. That is, kf is equal to 0. What equal to 0 means what? identically zero functions that is k f of x equal to zero for every x that is integral zero to x f x dx equal to zero for every x. What does this mean? If integral zero to x f x dx equal to zero for every x, I can differentiate both sides. Both sides are now differentiable functions. See, fx will be 0 for every x. Because this is the integral of a continuous function, it will be continuous, that is very easy to see. And this is the 0 function, 0 for all x, so this is the differentiable. So if I differentiate, they must be equal, so which implies fx equal to 0 for every x. So there is a contradiction. We started with f not equal to 0, which implies f is the 0 function. 
the zero function of series. One contradiction. Because we said there exists an f not equal. So there, this all problem because lambda we assume. Therefore, lambda equal to zero is not an ideal. Now we have to look at other lambdas. It's a one one function. Hmm? It's a one one function. Yeah. So one thing is, yeah, it's a one one function. That doesn't mean anything. In the infinite dimensional, there's a lot of questions. See, there's a fundamental theorem. So can we say like this, if I take any value of x, yes. if I take 2x1, x2, yes. the function, I mean that y1, y2, yes. uh, kx, y1 yes. and kx, y2 are not same. So just like it is not linear combination of... Say that again, I didn't uh, get it. K, kx, y1 yes. and kx, y2, y1 not equal to y2 yes. is not same for this particular function. That's why, just like... No, look at that kxy is equal to 1 for all y less than x. No. Uh, Isn't it? In the lower part, it's all 1. It's like a lower triangular matrix having all 1s. Even if y1 is not equal to y2, it is, they are same. kxy1. See, for example, kx half x is equal to kx one third x. So, y1 is one third x, y2 is half x, and kx half x is equal to kx one third x, both equal to 1, but y1 is not equal to y2. Uh, no, I mean for all x, but y1 and y2 are different, but I mean, but for every x, like, uh, I mean, suppose this is... Okay, we will talk about it. I think there is some uh, misunderstanding here. Okay. So anyway, you agree with this at least, that lambda equal to 0 cannot be an eigenvalue. But now let us look at, look at the dispose of the other eigenvalue. So suppose lambda not equal. And then, suppose lambda is an eigenvalue. So lambda is an eigenvalue implies there exists f not equal to 0 such that kf equal to lambda f. That is implies there exists f not equal to 0 such that integral 0 to x f y dy is equal to lambda f. This implies two things. One, if I evaluate it at 0, I will get lambda f0 is 0 and since lambda is not 0, it will say f0 must be 0. So it implies lambda f0 is equal to 0 implies f0 is equal to 0. 2, again, this side is a differentiable function because it is integral of a continuous function and therefore f must be differential because e is equal to this. So, f is differentiable and if I now differentiate both sides, fx equal to lambda fx. Now, if you solve this differential equal to the only solution you get is fx is identically. So, it implies fx identically. So, therefore, there is no lambda going to R, which is an eigenvalue. <coughs> we said that it is depicted the uh, uh, lower triangular matrix for which every diagonal entry was an eigenvalue. So here every diagonal entry means was x equal to x, kxx must have been an eigenvalue, but it is not. So there is a problem, but it is not that big a problem because, okay, because you thought it is mimicking the lower triangular matrix, it happened, but suppose you had not that, that way, you only have, here is a linear transformation which is continuous and which does not have an eigenvalue. Well, even if you have a real n by n matrix, it may not have a real eigenvalue because if you are talking about real, you must look at real eigenvalue. It may not have a real eigenvalue. All the eigenvalues may be complex. You can have a 2 by 2 matrix, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. The characteristic problem is lambda squared plus 1 equal to 0. All the eigenvalues are complex. There are no real eigenvalues. There is not a big deal at all. So, it is not, it is our starting misleading that it almost like uh, uh, lower triangular matrix, something that happened to lower triangular should happen is no longer true. But still, it is not that big a problem. It did not have an eigenvalue that is all. But, Suppose 
we have made all this problem a complex problem itself. Instead of real continuous functions, I have taken complex continuous functions. And I have done all these complex things. Then also I would have had a similar problem. One way to look at it is that way. The other way to look at it is the following. Suppose I was still with real matrix, but there are in some cases where I am guaranteed real eigenvalues. What are they? If you have a real symmetric matrix, all its eigenvalues are real. But then what is meant by symmetry? Now should I say that kxy equal to kyx? kxy equal to kyx that's symmetry. The matrix corresponding continuum matrix. So should I say that kxy equal to kyx then I have a real symmetric uh, I have a symmetric transformation will I get a uh, real eigenvalues. Okay. But if you look at the matrix proof. So I will now cast the matrix proof in a language which is adaptable to us. And we will see a more appropriate framework is a Hilbert space framework. Not this Banach. This is this norm we got is not got from an inner product. The, the supremum norm is not see suppose you say a norm is derived from an inner product if you can write norm x squared is equal to <coughs> f comma f. But there is no uh, inner product that is defined on CR01 which will give this norm. So this makes it only a Banach space but this does not make it a Hilbert space. So there is a lot of structural differences here. Matrix below uh, with the uh, because all norms are equivalent in that we, go, we conveniently work with the Euclidean norm which gives the Hilbert space structure. But in this case, all norms are not equal. In infinite dimensional spaces, all norms are not equivalent and therefore each fellow will give a different structure. So now I am completely now changing my topic from real analysis. Well, it is in a sense analysis, it's real, okay. It's not a <laughs> fake analysis. So in that sense, it's real analysis. Let us look at matrix situation. Let us even allow complex, okay, whatever you want to do, you do. Uh, let's look at this. So now I'm going to look at the matrix situation. Let's look at an n by n matrix. An n by n complex. Uh, which is Hermitian, but the, the complex version of symmetry is Hermitian. What is meant by Hermitian? A transpose bar is, or a, uh, this is usually, what is the notation? A? Dagger. Star star star. Star. Okay. A dagger or A star. Some people use A star. Operator theory for those people use A star. There are also differences. You have you come from uh, the mathematical physics side into mathematics or you went from analysis side to mathematics, depending on that the notation of the universe will be star. Uh, then you went from the operator theory side to that also. Okay. Anyway, that's uh, so when you have a complex matrix, leave alone Hermitian for the time being. When you have a complex matrix, the characteristic polynomial is a nth degree polynomial with complex coefficients and the fundamental theorem of algebra says it will have n roots. Finished. You have already got the n eigenvalues. But all this is lost for us if we are dealing with infinite dimensional space. It, it also suggests that something crazy could go on because suppose just loosely talking instead of just a finite matrix I have infinite number of rows and infinite number of columns okay 
and crazily I wrote determinant lambda i minus a as I did for it and I put all those and try to expand. Previously I said I will get a polynomial because I knew that there is a lambda, there is a lambda, there is a lambda, there is a lambda along the diagonal so the highest power I get is lambda to the power of n. But now what will I get? I could, I will get a not, I will get all powers of lambda. So I will get a power series in lambda. Instead of getting a polynomial in lambda as my characteristic polynomial, for such matrices I could at least formally define a power series in lambda. There it terminated at the nth stage. But here any power I can get. So I can go on and on and on. I will get a power series as a formal characteristic polynomial. But here I applied the fundamental theorem of algebra, an nth degree polynomial of n roots. There is nothing like a fundamental theorem of power series which says that every power series will have infinite number of roots. In fact, it doesn't, suppose you take the power series for e to the power of lambda. It's a power series, there are no roots. e to the lambda never vanishes. So therefore, you are stuck. There is no guarantee that there will be an eigenvalue. Okay. So, but all these power series, polynomial arguments, all really are not, uh, are going to be difficult if you are going to deal with this function spaces where you have got an infinite, uh, uncountable number of uh, components. And therefore, let us look at how we will write the matrix thing carefully in a way we will cop, we will be able to immediately take it over to the, the spaces. So, so now I am going to change the structures somewhat carefully. So now I am going to look at the matrix thing. Now, we have therefore a transformation from C n to C, which is defined by the matrix uh, any vector x is mapped to the vector A times x. It's a matrix multiplication. The transformation is only the matrix multiplication. Now we will take the L2 now. That is, norm of any vector is summation mod x i square i equal to 1 to n square. I mean, it is crazy to use the index i when you are dealing with complex numbers because for mathematician i is square root of minus 1. Once the moment you are in the complex. But of course, for electrical engineers, no problem is j is the square root of minus 1. And so, it is okay. Uh, so, let us take this. Then, I am going to make several statements. This can be interpreted as if and only if Ax, the inner product, okay, the inner product is x comma y is equal to summation xi yi bar i equal to 1 to n. So the norm x is simply the square root of x comma y, dot product. Okay. Instead of dot product, I am using the term only dot product. If and only if this That is, you can move the A from one factor to the other factor in the inner product without any change. Then I call it the, the that is what the real uh, uh, Hermitian means, okay, in terms of the inner product. So, therefore, the moment I have the inner product thing, <coughs> there is a chance of my talking about Hermitian transformations also. The second thing that happens is the following. Look at now we have A is a continuous linear transformation. We have always seen that A is continuous linear. Whenever you have finite dimensional the linear, this thing all boils down to coordinate based convergence. Okay. So it is a continuous linear transformation and it can be interpreted in a different way. The continuity of A is same as saying if you look at any vector x and look at its transform and look at the original vector, then compare the length. It's like as I mentioned some time back, look at the elastic measurement, the quantification of this elasticity. At every point look at how much it is stretched 
to the original length okay and then see what is the maximum damage it can do now how do you know there is a maximum i must say it is a supremum at least to start with i must say that it must be a supremum this must be finite that must be a finite supremum continuity means this and this means continuity both are equal and this is a quantification of that transformation this rest this quantity is called the another miss abuse of notation not a such a bad abuse of notation it's called the norm of the transformation itself it's a quantification of the transformation so so it's it is something like what is the maximum damage as far as elongation is concerned it can make right now there are various ways of looking at this it turns out the symmetry the hermitian thing gives the following this norm a is the same as look at the vector look at its transform and look at the inner product of the original fellow that is the transformed fellow versus the original fellow you take the inner trans inner product now you can say why should i take the uh, transform whichever way i take this inner product is going to be the same because ax comma x is equal to x comma x and it's irrelevant i'm going to put a modulus also here and this is i am going to put something here because right side is something depending on x left side is a number so there must be something wrong so i must uh, put something else here what happens here is i can push this norm x here and make that thing inside as of length 1 so this is also the same as supremum of all those x that that unit vectors becomes so in other words at each place take a unit vector for unit length how much is the damage step that's all that's a standard measure and it turns out the same thing you can do here also this is another way of getting that quant so that quantification can be got in many ways you got in the common so first the common sense way take the over a new length versus the original length then you find all that i can all normalize it always look at the unit length then i find that i can compare the original length to the take the dot product of the original length with respect to the transformed length and then take the modulus and then take the supremum i will get this is a, a important result for uh, hermitian uh, matrices now i am going to make some statements So whatever I am doing for the matrix thing is as well as what I am going to say immediately for the next one is about hundred hundred and seven years old. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, the, the the other one is about eighty years old, eighty five years old. Right. So, but matrix one is a little older than that. Okay. Now. I am going to look at this whole thing. What is on the right hand side as a, a different way? I have this C N. Okay. I have this C N. In this C N, I am looking at all those vectors which are of length one, which is that unit sphere, right? That is that unit sphere, not my C. Center is here. I am looking at the sphere, the previous one. Then I take a vector x here on that sphere, and then I map it to this number. So what I am doing is I am having a map from that sphere to the real line. So in that sense, I am still doing real analysis. At least the 
is a mapping onto the real line. Okay. So I am a function from the boundary of that whatever you want to call it, a boundary or whatever that sphere of unit radius to this. Now we saw that if we have a mapping between two metric spaces and if it is continuous and if the domain is compact, what is it? The image is also compact, but the image is compact, the image must be in the real line. So it must be a compact set on the real line, therefore it must be bounded. Okay? Not only that, it must attain its maximum, minimum, everything. Okay. So what? Therefore, yes, this fellow is a compact set on C M because it is bounded, it is closed. If you take a sequence of vectors whose length is one, the limit will also have length one. So it's a closed set. It is automatically bounded because all of them are not one. So one itself is a bound. So this yes, this fellow is a compact set in C N. So I have a mapping from a compact set to R. So the image must be a compact set and therefore bounded, attain is bound, all these things happen. Therefore, the supremum is actually attained. There is a maximum. Okay. Therefore, sup a x x comma x is actually a max. What does that mean? That is, there exists an x naught in C n such that a x x is less than or equal to a x naught x naught modulus for every x in C and therefore this is the supremum and therefore norm a which is equal to the supremum of a x comma x with x belonging to with norm x 1 is actually equal to this a x naught actually equal to a x naught x naught. So for one vector it is actually attained. Right. So now therefore this must be this modulus of this is equal to this. Therefore without the modulus it should be either equal to this or minus of that. So let us take one. So a x naught comma x naught is equal to either from a or one of them it should be. Okay. So let us call which one, whichever one it is, I will call it as some mu. If it is equal to norm a, I will call norm a as mu. If it is equal to minus norm a, I will call minus norm a as. Now I am going to do some calculations. Finally, uh, I want to look at this. Okay. Right. Uh, what is by my fact that I am using the inner product, the length of any vector square is the inner product of the vector with itself. Okay? So, if we call A x naught minus mu x naught as some y, norm y squared is y comma y, that is all. Now, I am going to expand this inner product. First is A x naught A x naught which is norm A x naught square then a x naught mu x naught, so it will be minus mu into a x naught x naught. Why did I not put mu bar here? Because in an inner product, when you take mu out from the second factor, it should come out with a bar, but mu is real. Because it is plus norm a or minus norm a, norm a is a real number. And then this one minus mu x naught a x naught, which is the same as a x naught x naught, so again I will write it as twice that, plus mu into mu, mu square x naught x naught, what is it? 1, because I am taking all vectors with norm 1. Okay. But this is always positive, because norm square is always positive. But this is less than or equal to y because the maximum damage that can be done is norm a. 
Okay? So therefore, the maximum of all the norm A x squared is norm A squared. So this is norm A squared minus 2 mu. Uh, what is A x naught x naught? That's what I called as mu. Minus 2 mu squared plus mu squared. But this is what mu squared is. Because norm A is exactly equal to A x naught A x naught. So what did I get? Zero. So therefore that fellow must be zero or A x naught equal to A x naught. And X naught is norm one, and therefore it's not zero. So mu must be an eigen. Therefore, mu must be So what this says is, if we had a Hermitian matrix, either plus norm A or minus norm A must necessarily be an eigenvalue and it will be the largest eigenvalue. The rest of them will start coming down, largest in the sense of modulus. The rest of them will start coming down and down. I am not going to go to the rest of them yet. I will still stick to the only this one, this I can work. Now I ask, suppose I want to copy all this in the general Hilbert space or general situation, function space. What will all I do? I will replace this by the general space. And here I will have that space. This result is still true. This result is still true. This is also true if you have a continuous transformation. It is Hermitian. In fact, this is not what is this is the definition. The thing is said to be Hermitian if this takes place. Okay. Then we will do the same thing. We will get this. But at this place, I cannot say it is a maximum because that is not compact. In infinite dimensional spaces, the sphere of unit radius is not compact. In fact, it is, that is classification, that is characterization of a space is in the nonlinear space is infinite dimensional if and only if the unit sphere is not compact. Okay. So therefore, there we are stuck. Well, if we are stuck, we don't give up. Okay, what will I do? Here I had there exists x n, x naught. Because the soup was maximum. If the soup was, I don't know if it's not a maximum, if it, if I do not know it's a maximum. Because the soup, at least I know something will converge to it. Therefore, from this stage onwards, I am just going to indicate this proof. At this stage onwards, what will happen is, there exists an XM. I will now replace the uh, CN by that space. XM such that AXN XM converges to this soup. But the supremum excess is what I called as. So therefore, the mod AX converges to this. Therefore, what I will have is, I will have an XN such that AXN XN converges to plus norm A or minus norm. Again, I will call this as mu. It will converge to one of them. AXN XN converges to mu. I will do the same thing. Calculate that norm. What will I get now? Same calculations, this is equal to AXN minus mu XN, AXN minus mu XN, which is equal to AXN, AXN is <coughs> norm AXN. Same calculation, so I am going to write it as uh, very quickly, plus mu squared, and this is less than or equal to norm A, XN squared is 1, and this mu. Right? 
Now what happens is an extreme right when n tends to infinity. This is mu squared. This is mu squared. But a x n x n goes to mu. So mu squared minus 2 mu squared plus mu squared. So that will go to 0. And this fellow gets, gets sandwiched between 0 and 0. So you will go to so this tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. Therefore, the square goes to 0. Therefore, axn minus mu xn tends to 0. But I still haven't got anywhere. I want ax equal to mu x. But I don't know whether xn converges. If xn also converged, then I can let n go to infinity and say ax minus mu x equal to 0. And I'll get mu as n. But I don't know whether xn converges. All I know is, I have an xn so that this damn thing converges to me. But I don't know whether xn itself converges. But I don't even want xn to converge. I even beg if some subsequence of xn converges. If some subsequence of xn converges, for that subsequence it still will be true. And now in that I will take the limit and I will get ax equal to mu x and I will get mu as an eigenvalue. Okay. So, the, the, the final thing that, see, if you look at a book, you will find a definition. The definition is because of all these things copied what the matrix fellows did and then finally this is the place I need some help and therefore that is a definition. Okay. If a subsequence xn k of xn converged, then we have axn and uh, because these are all norm 1, x will also be norm 1, so I will get a So what happened was we need to, needed some help, whereas in the matrix theory, the, the thing came out to us just like that because the unit sphere was compact. But in infinite dimensional spaces, the unit sphere is not compact. So therefore, to pack up for that, we need something better. So what we said was, unit sphere is compact means finite dimensional. Now, once you had an infinite dimensional space, really we can't do anything about it. Now what we are saying is that map be such that, the transformation be such that I can't do anything about the domain, I can't do anything about the co-domain, at least let the range be like finite dimensional. What is meant by finite dimensional? All I wanted was whenever I had a sequence which is bounded, I wanted a subsequence which converged. Xn was a sequence which was bounded, which was norm 1. Its image See, now I am going to change this. Even if I had this converges to some void, then I will have then the existence of x. Because a x and k minus v x and k converges and a x and k converges to y, therefore x and k will also converge if mu is not 0. It will not be zero because it is plus norm here, norm here. If it is zero, then the whole operator is zero, and nothing to do. And therefore, we will get something. So, the moral of the story is that if we had a transformation from here to here, it was continuous. If this was finite dimensional, there is no problem. Okay? If this was infinite dimensional, then this is also, it is an operator from here, this is also infinite dimensional. But k is taking this whole thing to some place. Now what we wanted was that sphere which was a bounded set, its image here must be such that the image must have a convergence of sequence. That is all I want. And that is where the definition of compact operator or completely continuous operator comes. An operator is said to be compact if from if from every bounded sequence xn the image sequence kxn has a convergent subsequence and once you have that additional thing a compact Hermitian operator will always have an eigenvalue now once they got this breakthrough 
everything that could be done for matrix Hermitian, more or less can be completely carried out for compact Hermitian transformations. Okay. And that is a great beautiful piece of work by Ries, Frederick Ries. And the uh, best place to read it is his own book, Ries and Nash Functional Analysis. It's one of the, I think one of the best easy easiest thing to understand is that book. You, there are many more books that have come after that, but all of them try to make it very complicated by making more generalizations and all. But there is no, there is no book which is, has more clarity than this book. So therefore, the whole idea of eigenvalues changes. It is looking at, not at the domain space, but where this fellow is taking them all, after all the linear, the transformation is finally, he is dumping them somewhere, so I have to observe that place. So what is happening there? You, he brings every bounded fellows here and dumps them. In the dump part there is a subsequent that conversion. In the original part there was no subsequent because he had the unit sphere. There was no subsequent of the unit sphere that converges. But look at the dump part, there is always a subsequence that converges. So I'll basically say, well, I, I, I know that you are going to be an infinite dimensional space. I know that my codomain is also an infinite dimensional space. At least give me the transformation in such a way, the transfer part looks like a finite dimensional space. Every bounded set must have a convergent subset. That's what a compact operator is. In other words, the image of a bounded set is relatively compact, is what the definition they will give. Okay. The image of a bounded set must be relatively compact. What all means is this. Let's look. Right. So therefore, now let's look at again some. In fact, there is a there is a very nice uh, thing. There is nowhere I have uh, assumed the completeness of the space. Okay. Nowhere I have assumed the uh, completeness. Of all I asked was, whenever you take a bounded set and look at its image, that image must have a convergence of That's all I asked. Okay? You could do it in a non-incomplete basis, all this theory. But anyway, there are certain advantages. So now let's look at... Now let me, let me uh, very quickly work with Hilbert spaces only, because there was this inner product and uh, Hermitian nature, etc., that came into the picture. Yes. Sir, is there an example for an uh, unbounded operator? Unbounded operator? Differentiation operator is unbounded. It takes x to the n, the nx to the power of n minus 1. So, suppose you are working with CR01, okay, or all bounded uh, differentiable functions of 0, 01, then the n will carry it higher and higher. The norm will go on increased. Now many unbounded operators as well. The, the theory of unbounded operators is even more difficult. Uh, but lot of things have been done there also. Compact but everything will be mimicking this. Compact okay. operators are bounded. Yeah, I'm talking about bounded compact. Okay. They, they can be unbounded. Yeah, if, if it does all a, that is what they call as completely continuous operators. They don't bother about bounded. The image of a bounded set must have a convergent subsequence. That's all they ask. So there is a slight terminology problem. Some people originally uh, Ries used the terminology completely continuous. But he applied it specifically for linear completely continuous address. Okay. Uh, what was this? Now what happens is, I will give you a very, suppose I take L2A, 0, 1. I will let me, uh, let me list it. Now, I have not said what is L2, the Lebesgue problem, etc., etc., etc. So, don't worry about Lebesgue integration at all. Think only about all functions from 0, 1 to R such that their integral is defined and that is fine. Riemann integral is defined and this is the area of this. Take the square function, the area must be well defined under that curve, it is less than 1. So, let us assume Riemann theory we know. Yeah, yeah. If you take this space, the, the, the result noted with this is, is not a Hilbert space. 
uh, if you are doing only with Riemann integrals. But it, it, this theory doesn't require it to be a Hilbert space. Okay. And then you will define the inner product of two such functions, so now 0 to 1, f t, g t, bar t. Okay, you can take complex one of the functions. Okay. Now a whole class of operators do this. Now suppose I look at f going to kf, where kf is defined as its value at any point x, in integral 0 to 1, sub k of x minus y f of y t y. There is some kind of a convolution which can be, but only in the, in the range 0, 1. It is a called finite convolution. And if k, let us take a very simple version. If k, on more general situations it is true, k is a continuous function on 0, kt. Therefore, I am to give it only kt minus y. So then what happens is, this is continuous. On this, on this place. Now, the interesting thing is, you might have on this side discontinuous functions. You might have on this side step functions also, whose integral is square integral is finite. But this fellow takes everybody and dumps them into continuous functions. So therefore, we are now back to. So what it does is, I'll just uh, make remarks and quit. For every f such that integral mod f squared is finite. Kf in the continuous function. And therefore, the question arises I have this unit sphere here, it dumps it to inside the continuous space. Now I am asking for a subsequence that converges, right? That is what the completely continuous thing demands. I want a subsequent that converges but in the square now. But if I have a subsequent that converts in the uniform sense, it will automatically converts in the square now. So now I am in the space of continuous function, I can ask different things. Ask uniform convergence itself. Suppose I have a uniform convergence. So what does I have? I have a bounded set. It gets mapped onto a bounded set. Now I have a bounded set. What is my bounded set? Uniformly bounded set in the space of continuous function. Suppose I show that they are also uniformly bounded and it is, I want a convergent subsequence. That will happen if that space is, the closure is compact. When is it compact? It is uniformly bonded and equally continuous. It turns out this is